Okay, my apologies for the abrupt ending of that previous video. Um, we will continue on now. Okay, uh, so uh, crossbridge cycling then. So the first thing which happens is that um, the um, myosin head here is going to drop the phosphate group, okay? So that phosphate group is going to come off and instead what it's going to do is it's going to form a bond basically uh, with one of these actin monomers. So now I won't draw all eight of these actin monomers, I'll just draw one. So it's now formed a bond with this actin monomer here and that bond is known as a cross bridge basically and that's why the entire process is um, called cross bridge cycling. So it forms a cross bridge. That's the first step. So this is a cross bridge. Okay? And in order to form that cross bridge, it has to drop the phosphate group, basically. That's the first thing that has to go. Okay, so here's the um, actin monomer, and here is the uh, myosin head here. Still bound to ADP, and importantly, it has this uh, phosphate group that the myosin light chain kinase put on it, which is why it's able to do this cross bridge cycling at all. Okay, the next step is that it's going to drop ADP and perform what's known as the power stroke. Now, in the power stroke, what's going to happen is the entire conformation of the uh, myosin head is going to change, or the myosin protein is going to change. Basically, the myosin head is going to move like so. So, it's going to flip from being at an angle like this to being at an angle like that, basically, relative to its fibrous tail. So, it's going to come and approach a structure that looks like this, okay? And that's going to move the actin um, filament, well, the actin monomer, uh, relative to the fibrous tail. Now, uh, this is called the power stroke, basically. And in order for it to happen, you have to drop that molecule of ADP. So the myosin head is going to cleave the bond between itself and this ADP molecule. And when it does that, that's going to trigger uh, the power stroke, which is going to move uh, the uh, actin monomer relative to the, um, well, relative to this fibrous tail, as you can see. Now, this is the important bit to understand. If we look at this from the perspective of this entire great big contractile unit that I've drawn here, so we'll have to draw it on this side as well. So we've got these myosin heads coming off on this side here as well, which again have all been phosphorylated by the myosin light chain kinase and are undergoing this uh, cross bridge cycling process as well. Now, when the myosin heads on this side perform the uh, power stroke, they're going to move from having a conformation like up here to having a conformation like that. When that happens, they are going to move the actin filament in this direction. So all these actin filaments are getting, going to get pushed this way. On this side, um, what's going to happen is these myosin heads are going to power stroke in this direction. So they're going to have a conformation, go from having a conformation like that to having a conformation like that. It's the same process, it's just that these ones are uh, twisted around 180 degrees, basically, relative to these ones. So they're still going through the same conformational change, it's just they're oriented in a different way. So that's going to mean that these actin filaments are pulled in this direction. So overall, what you're going to do is you're going to bring both of these dense bodies closer together, basically, and that's how you're going to contract uh, this contractile unit. Okay, so that's the power stroke, and basically this molecule of ADP is now going to cleave off, basically. That's the adenosine diphosphate molecule. Okay, now what happens is you cleave the cross bridge, so you get cross bridge cleaving is the next process. Cross bridge cleaving, and the way that this happens is that you bring in a molecule of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, bind it to the myosin head, and then that causes the cross bridge to cleave. So here's the actin uh, monomer, here's the myosin head, but now they're no longer linked basically because instead the myosin head now has ATP linked to it. Okay, so to look at the bigger picture, what's going to happen is all of these heads are going to adopt this um, power stroke conformation. So they're all going to have moved uh, into this new orientation where they're closer, basically, to their fibrous tail, okay? And uh, they've moved the actin filament as well, and now 
ATP is going to come along, bind, and cleave all the cross bridges. So the actin filament is going to remain sort of in this new position that it's been moved into, but now the cross bridges are going to cleave. And what's going to happen finally, if I just colour in these to remind you of which one's the myosin head and which one's the actin monomer, and it's important uh, that I also remember to put in these phosphate groups because they remain bound to it at absolutely all times. I don't want to give you any delusion about that. Okay, now what's going to happen is this ATP molecule is going to be hydrolyzed. So you get hydrolysis of this ATP molecule. And let me just put an arrow in there. Um, and the hydrolysis of the ATP molecule returns uh, the myosin protein to its original conformation where the myosin head is further away from its fibrous tail here. Okay, and now basically, once the ATP has been hydrolyzed, it goes back to having a molecule of ADP bound to it because the ATP has been hydrolyzed into ADP, and also it's got this inorganic phosphate from the hydrolysis of the ATP. So now it's back in the original position it was basically, but it's moved to this actin monomer, which was at the start right above it. Now that actin monomer is over here basically. Okay, so here's that actin monomer. Here's the myosin head here in turquoise. And here in pink is the phosphate group. So to make this maybe make a bit more sense, let me draw a picture of the entire actin filament now. So let me add some more actin monomers on. Okay, so basically that actin monomer, which was originally right above it, has now been moved over here relative to it. And that's how it's going to gradually move these actin filaments in this direction, and in this case, in this direction. Okay, so we have drawn this process happening, basically, for a myosin head on this side. Okay, so that's the process by which the muscle actually begins to contract. Okay? Now, um, in order to bring about relaxation, what happens is the calcium, uh, well, the, if the acetylcholine signal goes, then the IP3 is going to go. Uh, that's going to stop releasing calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. Then the circa pump in the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane is going to gradually return all the calcium back into the ER. And either, so therefore, either you, your um, signals will go, whichever of those signals it was, whether it was a, a calcium wave or a calcium puff, they're going to go, basically. And that means that the calcium calmodulin concentration is going to go down, the myosin light chain kinase activity is going to go down, uh, so it's going to stop phosphorylating these myosin heads. And basically, there is another enzyme which is always working to remove these myosin heads called myosin light chain phosphatase, myosin light chain phosphatase and once the myosin light chain kinase has stopped working it will basically just remove all of these phosphate groups and stop uh, the um, sliding filament mechanism so well or stop cross bridge cycling but another name for uh, cross bridge cycling is the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction or uh, the well this large picture here is really the sliding filament of muscle of sliding filament mechanism of muscle contractions let me write it out in full sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. So this idea that the myosin filaments uh, will um, move up the actin filaments, that's what's known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction, basically. Okay, um, and cross bridge cycling really refers to the micro details of how the sliding filament me mechanism of muscle contraction is working, basically. Okay, so that's how you get relaxation because that's going to terminate basically when um, when the um, when the um, myosin light chain kinase activity goes down and then the myosin light chain phosphatase is going to remove all the phosphate groups. You're going to stop getting cross bridge cycling, and uh, all of the um, all of the um, cross bridges will start cleaving, and then everything will just relax back down. Okay, uh, so. Um, 
that, well, actually, it's slightly more complicated than that in smooth muscle. You can get uh, the cross bridges remaining uh, formed even after the muscle has relaxed. Uh, they're so-called latch bridges. And uh, that means that, basically, the smooth muscle can remain in the contracted state even though the calcium has gone down. It will just remain in that smaller state, basically. And that means that uh, you can get... Um, uh, tubes which align by smooth muscle having their diameter changed permanently, basically. Uh, well, for a lot of, well, for indefinitely. Um, without expending a huge amount of ATP in the cross bridge cycling, just by having the cross bridges held, um, you know, fixed, and then it, obviously the muscle will remain in that state. Even though it's not generating an active tension, it will just remain in that contracted form, and then that will alter the lumen, uh, which is lined by this smooth muscle. Okay, uh, so uh, one final thing just to discuss is that if you have a local acetylcholine stimulus, you're just going to get contraction of these contractile units in that local region where the calcium has gone up and is therefore activating um, the um, myosin-like chain kinase, whereas if you've got a global acetylcholine signal, you're going to get calcium going up globally, and therefore uh, you'll get contraction globally.